right, let's move on with the Cloud Megacast. We have more great presenters, and in, in, along with that, I'd like to introduce our next presenter. That's Mr. Steve Connor. He is the Vice President of Sales at Cloudistics. Are you there, Steve? I am. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for joining us today. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much, and thanks for everybody who's on this webcast. I'm going to do my best to give you guys a sense on how we're going to potentially help you out inside of the, the public cloud and ultimately look at ways to help get this some of those workloads potentially back on-prem. So when we look at the world today, you know, there's a, there's a definite movement of things going to the cloud, and we heard that just in the last presenter's presentation. And a lot of the things that we see that are driving those things are, are, are speed, simplicity, consumption, and continuous innovation. So when we're working with the big guys out there, you know, the, the standard characters, AWS, Google, and Azure, a lot of people are of these four main criteria. And I'm assuming that pretty much everybody on the phone has either already gone to the cloud in some form or factor, faction, or they're heading there, or their bosses have told them to go there. So this is a real thing that we're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, when we look at what drives those types of activities and, and, and dives in further on those four buckets, businesses are looking at IT and, and looking at them with a different lens. They want us to be different, right? They, they were looking at more consumption-based type of activities. They want things to be almost like a utility. So when we look at what at businesses, the business side of the house are asking us, they want us to be lean. They want us to actually make things get to market fast. So, and that's one of the promises that Amazon and Azure and all the other cloud providers bring. They want to also be able to have some predictability on their growth. When we look at you know, traditional architectures and, and some of the newer ones, that manageability is, is somewhat challenging because we're always having different components and not necessarily in lockstep with each other. And then as we look at you know, cost and predictable performance and ultimately the silos of management, these are all things that ultimately we get as the promise of going to the cloud. Now, when we look at the cloud, we have to look at our workloads as well. So workloads are all not created equal. Um, when we look at the, the basic infrastructure, a basic business platform, you're going to have some workloads that are elastic. Those are the ones that are going to have you know, the variability. They're going to either burst up and down, very much like a DevOps shop. They could be web servers. They could be a lot of seasonality. And those elastic workloads, those types of workloads, are 100% perfect for those cloud environments. Those are the things that it, if I'm selling to a customer, I would absolutely tell them, you need to move that to one of those cloud providers because it's going to be the best bang for your buck. If we look at the rest of the, of the market's uh, business section, applications like SAP, uh, PeopleSoft, your finance applications, and things that are generally running 24 by 7, those are a lot more predictable. And when we, when we look at those things, we ultimately are going to see them running consistently. And those sometimes make sense in the cloud, but in a lot of instances they don't, either because it's a heavy workload to move, you've got security constraints potentially that could get in the way, or it may just be too expensive. If you've ever run a workload in the cloud, and we have is Cloudistics, you know, you can start to see those 24 by 7 workloads ratchet up really, really fast on your bills. So we, we always, when we start working with our customers, always want to start looking at the, the application first, and we are an application first company, and then figure out what the best solution is. And, and sometimes we're the right solution, sometimes we're not. When we look at the pros and cons of these large providers, and this is how I'm going to dovetail in on how we're going to help here. You know, when we look at the pros of, of large hyperscaler cloud providers, you know, we've already touched on a couple of those things. But the reason you, know, you get uh, rogue IT, and, and I think that a lot of companies are, are struggling with that, is you know, the speed thing. Sometimes as IT professionals, because we've got different silos, it's a little bit challenging to get things to people in the time that they need it, especially with agile programming footprints and things like that. It can be really, really challenging to meet the speed needs that some of our organizations want. They also, you know, when you get into these things, they are low cost to start with. You can get into, you know, a pretty decent sized Amazon instance for as little as 70 bucks a month. And, and that's, that's something that is very, very enticing to a developer who's struggling to meet his deadlines and has a credit card and is ready to just pull the trigger. 
So those, that utility model, low cost, and really easy to use is, is the big pros of those guys, right? When we look at the, co the cons associated with the cloud, we talked about security in the beginning, in the previous presentation. But one of the things that we look at, and I've looked at over my career, is lock-in, right? When we go into a cloud, and having done this myself, um, we, we're in a position where you've got, um, you, you, you basically, it's, it's Hotel California. Once your data goes in, it's going to be there, and it's extremely difficult to get it out. So you're going to see that, you know, if you make that decision, you've got to make it wisely and, and move forward with the fact that it's going to be sometimes tough to get it out there. The other thing that I see when I'm working with an Amazon or an Azure is, is this idea of flexibility. So, you know, it, it seems to be extremely flexible. Um, but when we look at how these things work, you know, you have to make your application fit the system not the system fit the applications. And that comes down to t-shirt sizing, right? Uh, a lot of these providers, because they are homogeneous and have to serve the masses, ultimately are, have built their, their products in such a way that you, you, you have one size. And if your application doesn't quite fit into that, you either have to shoehorn it in or you have to go up to the next level, which is going to cost you more. And, and we think that, you know, ultimately that you need that level of flexibility to have true control over an application. And I can give you an example. We've got a customer that we work with that has a homegrown application that is very specific with respect to the amount of memory that you know, it needs. It is four gigabytes. Anything less, it doesn't perform well. Anything over, it thrashes. And that would not necessarily fit in an Amazon instance per se. So those are the types of things that I look at from a flexibility standpoint that people are going to be paying attention to when they look at it. And then you look at, obviously, visibility control gets into security. You know, I've got a lot of neighbors. It is a public swimming pool, so we've got to deal with that. And then the biggest thing, especially when we start looking at large use cases like Splunk, Hadoop, and other things like that, you, you got to take into consideration that, that you've moved a relatively large workload off-premise, and now you got to figure out how to link up to it. So that's going to change your application profile and potentially change your bandwidth profiles up. So those are... Those are things that, that obviously pop up. And then if you've done Amazon or Azure or any of those things and done it 24-7, you've obviously seen the bill, right? So that, those are the cons that we see in these things. Now, we have built a platform, and it is truly a platform that's designed to give you a lot of the same functions and features, the pros of the public cloud, and give you a lot of the flexibility and security structures of being an on-premise cloud. So when you look at this platform, it's a complete composable cloud. And I'll explain that in a couple of slides. But what that means is the platform includes all the components that you need under one single pane of glass. So it is a networking compute and storage built together and managed through software, so completely software defined. The cool thing about this platform is it also is application focused. I will show you that later on in that we actually have the ability to deploy applications literally from a marketplace. We build those ourselves, but we also work with our customers to actually build those as well. And, and another big thing that a lot of you know, my competitors struggle with is multi-tenancy. And this is true multi-tenancy down to the very block level. So if you want to partition on physical resources, phenomenal. If you want to do logical partitioning inside of that physical partition, phenomenal. That's built into the footprint from day one, and, and you have all those features. And as we get into cost models, which I'll explain a little bit later, we've designed the way we, we basically bring this to market in such a way that's very similar to the cloud as well. So when we look at the complexity associated with traditional IT, there are a lot of moving parts. So you've got, obviously, you're going to have some networking interfaces and switches and things like that. You're obviously going to have servers, right? You can't work without servers. And those guys are going to be connected with some sort of card into some sort of SAN. That SAN is going to be living on some sort of storage infrastructure like EMC or NetApp or something like that. And that's a one big physical block. If I look at that as, a, as an administrator or an operator, I see that as four control planes that I have to manage independently of one another. And that's not very cloud-like, right? Then we add on hypervisor. That is yet again another control plane that we have to manage, and it's something that's right, you know, part of the stack. And then finally, we get to applications. And this, at the end of the day, is what every single 
business owner cares about. He, he or she could care less about that big stack of stuff underneath the applications. Um, but that, that stack of stuff is needed to get to, to delivering these applications. So inside of Cloudistics, we saw the platform on the previous slide, but we take all of that physical infrastructure, everything up to and including that storage footprint, and wrap it into a single platform. Now, we take it one step further. Our hypervisor is also integrated in the platform and managed from the same interface that, you would, that you'd be using to manage all the physical infrastructure. And then lastly, we spoke about it. We have built into the platform an application marketplace that we build and, and basically build orchestration controls that will allow you to deploy complex applications from a single click. So here you can see specifically Splunk. We've set up Splunk to where you literally can click that up, dial in the parameters on the indexers and search heads and all the other components that are, going to, that are needed for Splunk, and it will deploy whatever number of virtual machines on top of that platform that you need to run Splunk. So we're rolling more and more of those as our partner ecosystem expands, but we see this as really being the way to get that true cloud feel on-premise. You've got to have everything under one umbrella, and you've got to make it so brain-dead simple that basically a sales guy like me could run it. Now, we do all of that through basically uh, a single, that single pane of glass, that single interface, and it's called Ignite. When you look at this, if you're a, a techie, hopefully you've got some techies on the phone, this should be very familiar to you if you've ever used a FlexBot. Uh, this is basically every interface that you need to actually manage and maintain a FlexBot, including all the funky wiring that you have to do. What we've done with the combination of that composable platform and Ignite is basically taken all of this and moved it into one elegant platform. And this is where you'll do all of your work, all of your networking, all of your access controls, all of your firewall controls, all of your server controls and virtualization controls are all done from here. The other thing that, that we discussed, and I wanted to make sure you guys saw, see it, is the application marketplace. This marketplace is, is a, uh, I would call it an ecosystem. So you can publish things here, and we're actually in the process of putting together a nomination page on our website that will allow you to nominate applications that we'll actually build and put into the marketplace. So we're looking at this to really, really make that application be the first class citizen in this infrastructure. Now, when we look at composability and we talk about composability, the, thing, the things that we think about when we look at composable is you, obviously for us, there's always going to be virtualized networking. We want to make sure that networking is, comes along for the ride. And with a lot of the, the hyperconverged platforms today, it just doesn't. So that's not there. Workload agnostic, you'll see as you get into this, we support a lot of different workloads. More importantly, because of the way we handle communications inside of this platform, and that's where all of our patents are, we can actually get block level access from the virtual machine down into storage. So speeds, you're talking guaranteed today, 45,000 IOPS per virtual machine. And with a release that will be coming out at the end of this month, we'll up that to over 100,000. So that agnostic workload capability is really important. And you'll see when we get to the fact that we have native container support that it's extremely important. Dynamic assembly I'll talk about in a few minutes. That's what we look at as the true composability of resources. Obviously, any solution today, if you can't scale on, an, on a dime, you're not going to be cloud-like. And then obviously, most companies today are looking for an API. So when we look at three of those things that, that really stick out, we've talked about the, that agnostic workload. So we can go from as little as a small VDI footprint, you know, a, a robo footprint, all the way up to a full Cloudera data lake in, in, inside of the same footprint. And we do that because of our, our secret sauce in the networking and the way we've done the resourcing. So you know, when we look at dynamic resourcing, we're also talking about having the ability to have those resources be federated pools that are independent of one another. With today's solutions that are in the hyperconverged space, all those resources are in one box and come along for the ride. So, you know, if I have an application that's, that's memory hungry and I need to feed that particular beast, I'm going to have to bring CPU and storage along for the ride and ultimately get this, this effect, I call it resource drift, that will ultimately pile up on you after, after a certain amount of time. And that, you know, if you're a service provider or somebody that's really paying attention to chargeback and things like that, that's a big deal because you now have to take into consideration a waste, a waste ratio as well. 
in cloudistics, because of the way everything's designed and independent blocks and managed from the, our cloud controller, you can scale storage independently of compute, memory independently of the, uh, the CPUs, and ultimately the network independently of, of all those other resources. And the goodness is, it happens automatically from the controller. And that, that controller can be delivered in two ways. One, it can be delivered in a SaaS footprint that is actually a container. We eat our own dog food here. So we are 100% Docker ready, right? And we decided that anything that we build that's going to be you know, cloud presented is going to be containerized. So we've taken our cloud portal and, and made it such that it's a container and our actual cloud portal lives in the cloud. You can also deploy that on-premise as well. So you can actually have that separation from the cloud and remove whatever security concerns you might have with that and bring that on-prem. Same feature set, same functions. The only thing is that in order to do the application workloads, you'd have to, to, to import those in. But that, that portal capability is there for you, and, and that drives the entire engine. We had a customer just a couple of days ago that needed to expand quickly because he had, he had some document processing requirements that he needed to get done. And within three minutes, he had a full block of storage, all flash, right? So everything in, in Cloud 6 is flash, and had two sets of computing resources plugged in and functioning, deploying applications in five minutes. So it's, it's that simple. So those types of things we see as being really, really important to having that message of being 100% composable. Now, when we look at you know, the scale up and scale out, a lot of the promise today in the industry, and, and people deliver to it, absolutely, is that you can pay as you grow. So what's happened in the industry is we've shrunk the profiles down, so we're no longer buying monolithic you know, controllers from NetApp and EMC and large, large blade chassis and things like that. But what's happened there, as we discussed, is you, you got a lot of payload that comes along for the ride. So as we've said, in Cloudistics, you can literally buy each of these resources independently and scale out, truly scale out, and pay as you grow. Now, I promised you that I would talk about how we are very cloud-like from a consumption standpoint on the cost as well. So inside of our, our, our consumption models, we have you know, the traditional way of buying the product, and that's just you know, buying, the, buying the platform. But we've also thought about how we can be more cloud-like. So inside of our, our portfolio, you can also buy this platform and consume it on a monthly basis. You literally can commit to as little as no utilization and, and do this monthly. And we're, we're building out our models in such a way that you can buy it that way. Uh, we think that that vendors that are claiming to be cloud vendors, on-premise cloud vendors, if they don't behave this way, they're not really truly answering the mail. So we're bringing that out. It, I'm officially announcing it on this webcast today. So when you work with Cloudistics, you'll be able to have those ratable types of consumption models out of the gates. So we talked about workloads as well. When we look at the different workloads that we support, and obviously we've seen the marketplace, you can see that we support a litany of different, uh, di different applications. This platform performs extremely well under pressure. We had a customer that just did SQL Server testing, you know, just plain run-of-the-mill SQL Server. We were going up a bit against a bare metal machine and a virtualized platform, so we were virtualized. We not only beat that SQL Server, we smoked it by eight times. So, you know, you get that bare metal performance footprint inside of the platform, and that gives you the abilities to run Splunk and Hadoop and MapR and all those types of things. And at the same time, if you partition it and use our multi-tenancy, you can also run your enterprise applications, our general purpose applications, or containers. So what does that mean? If I'm a company that's trying to transition from you know, traditional application footprints to containers, I can gracefully move into this footprint and run my applications as, as normal, and then ultimately transition to containers in parallel having both those sets running simultaneously on the same infrastructure. And from a, from a resource standpoint, 100% partitioned away from each other. So that gives you that kind of flexibility and control that you would normally see in the cloud uh, in a platform that would be your on-premise cloud. And we continue to expand the application portfolio, but you know, basically we haven't run up against the application that has caused us any trouble so far to date.
So what our ask of you guys is, you know, we want you guys to actually see this. We want to get our engineers in front of you and either, either schedule a technical session so we can walk you through how well the platform performs and then ultimately give you the ability to do a low-risk test drive. I mean, we are even willing to certain extents to lease out our labs. Um, I'm doing that for a couple of customers right now. We're so confident in the product that we actually offer a, a full money, a money back guarantee. So if you try it for 30 days and it doesn't meet your, your performance criteria, it doesn't meet the ease of use criteria, and it, or it simply just is, it's not the right product for you, as long as it, the boxes are not damaged, you can ship it back to us at no cost. So we're that confident in this product that we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. So kind of sum up, on-premise cloud with all the features and benefits that you'd expect from those, those mega, mega providers. And it gives you that flexibility and cost scenarios to actually truly deploy a composable fractional on-premise cloud that will run any workload in your environment. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, we got we got a lot of questions here for you. So, um, okay, cool. The first one, the first one, I think, is just you know more clarification. So, Cloudistics is it is it hardware, software, is it both, uh, and how is it how is it packaged? How is it licensed? So that is a great question. So the primary IP is in software, but it's packaged in hardware. So when you're buying that platform, you're going to get all three components. You're going to get network, storage, and compute as a core platform, and then you can build out each one. The software comes along for the ride. So when you buy, if you buy it in a non ratable format, you're going to get those three parts plus software and three years of maintenance included in one price. So we try to make it super simple for you guys to buy. Um, the goal is to expand the platform such that we have multiple OEMs that we work with from a hardware standpoint. Um, and, and really, at the end of the day, there is nothing special about what we're using. We're using FX2 blades from Dell, and we haven't changed anything under the covers. It's just some minor tap-ins. Um, so we, we could move. It's just, you know, we started there, and that's how we're going to deliver it today. But it's all one price. Maintenance is included for hardware and software as well. Nice, nice. And so is a virtualization hypervisor and a cloud management platform included in that as well? Absolutely. So everything so included in that would be all your gear, the – Marketplace, the hypervisor is built into the entire platform, and you're going to have access to the cloud portal. All we need to do when we, we, when we start setting up the engagement is know whether you want to do it off-premise or on-premise, and that just changes the way we work with you to do the installs, but everything that you saw today is included in the package. Nice, nice. So a lot of the kind of all-in-one you know, offerings that I've looked at before, they have software-defined storage and software-defined networking um, included in that. Can you tell us a little bit about those offerings in Cloudistics? Yeah, so, so when you look at that, I mean, I look at some of my competitors, and we'll just keep, keep the names off. A lot of times they'll have software-defined storage and software-defined server footprints of the virtualization, and that's generally where they stop. Some packages have software network virtualization as well, um, but it's done at the hypervisor level. What we're providing is not only hypervisor-level network virtualization, we're also providing network-level network virtualization. So you're going to get full feature flow from a physical switch down to the hypervisor, and you'll have basically full control of that entire network stream inside of that package. So it's a little different in that most of the time when you're dealing with you know, the other types of hypervisor packages, you're looking at soft switches. This is virtual switches and the physical switch itself. We, we actually overwrite the operating system on a Dell switch, and it's, it's, that's where a lot of our secret sauce lives. And it's a, is that a 10 gig switch? It's, so it starts out as 10 gig, and it's fully capable once Dell releases it to, from going from 10 to 100. Um, wow. The interfaces we, we ship right now are 10 gig. We ship with all the candles, so cabling is done, so you don't have to worry about cables and and any type of connectivity issues. Um, but 10 gig, uh, obviously with all the full bonding capabilities, and because everything for us is IP, we've stripped out a lot of you know, the, the overhead associated with some of the layer two linking protocols. 
and that gives us a lot more uh, flexibility with respect to speed. That's how we get that performance to the storage layer. Wow, wow. And so tell us a little bit more about this application catalog. Um, you said you all yep. are providing those applications in the catalog, and is it you all are maintaining those and updating those over time? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. So what we've done is we've picked key workloads that we know that we perform well against. So as you saw in that picture, you, you saw Docker, you saw Splunk, you saw Caldera, and we're going to continue to expand those catalogs and build them over time. The cool thing is, is that if a customer wants to publish their own, inside of their version of the either on-premise or off-premise uh, cloud portal, they can actually publish their own too. So it's a little better than templates, right, just VM templates. You can actually orchestrate in that tool and actually have the, the, the platform deployed from the marketplace. So when you deploy Splunk, literally all you have to do is tell the Splunk instances how much storage you want on, on the different components, memory and, and compute. And from the resource pool, so everything is a resource pool, it will pull it out of that zone and create those virtual machines for you exactly the way you told them to do it. And literally from click to, to launch of Splunk, uh, I, the last time I, I got, my, got my engineer, Carmel here, I think it's 10 minutes. It takes you to get all the way from click, click to start and ingesting data from Splunk. So it, it's, yeah. it's, literally, it's literally that easy. And we're going to continue to expand that portfolio. Nice, nice. And so uh, kind of what's the starting point? What's the entry point? So the entry point from a, from a infrastructure standpoint, two switches, right? Everything's got to be redundant. So we're always going to give you two switches. You can get, start as few as two computing nodes. So that's going to give you your memory and CPU resource pools. And then we can go as low as 6T of flash. Um, the flash blocks are, are capable of going up to 96 T of flash, and then we start expanding in, in blocks like that. Uh, and, and it is enterprise flash, so this stuff flies. But to get in small, two switches, two computers with low memory footprints and CPU footprints, and six terabytes of disk. Nice, nice. Um, so on the, uh, the test drive here, or the virtual lab, I'm sorry, what can, yeah. what can people access? So when you get a virtual lab from us, they can access everything. So literally, we're going to give you control of, of that, that, basically that configuration I just subscribed, or potentially bigger, depending on what you're doing from a benchmarking standpoint. And one of our engineers will help you get a feel for the interface. The interface takes about five minutes. I can drive the interface, so it's that easy. But you, 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 it takes about five minutes to get in, to work through, and understand the interface. And then you're, you're, you're off to the races. You can do whatever you want. If you want to partition and run two different workloads simultaneously, you can do that. Um, you can do benchmarking. It's, it's really up to you. It is a full platform that's dedicated to you in the virtual lab. It's not, it's not a synthetic. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I think that's a great you know, stopping point. We've run out of time, but you know, really cool presentation. Uh, sounds like a very fascinating, very innovative solution. Thanks for your time today, Steve. I appreciate it. Thanks, for everybody, for dialing in. I appreciate your time.